Welcome back to the Neurosymbolic Channel. I'm Paulo Shakarian, and with me today is Zach Serlin, who is a researcher at MIT Lincoln Labs. How are you doing, Zach? Good. How are you? Good. So um, a little bit of background here. So I met Zach at DARPA's AI Forward event back in the summer, and the reason why I invited him on the channel is when a lot of people think of neural symbolic AI nowadays, they think of things like logic tensor networks, logic neural networks, where the whole point is to propagate a gradient uh, through a, uh, some layers of logic to improve the learning process. But there is an entirely different use of the combination of neural and symbolic methods. And a big place that comes up with uh, comes up in is reinforcement learning. When you have uh, a agent that is trained to control a system, but you want to enforce constraints, usually in the form of some for, uh, sort of temporal logic to ensure things like safety and uh, meeting certain uh, guarantees for the given task at hand. And so Zach has been working on this for a number of years. Yeah, so I... Uh... I got into this a few years ago in, in my PhD, and I have a couple of papers that I can talk about that are looking at that from a kind of robotics and learning perspective. Uh, it's really about wrapping a reinforcement learning system in some type of formal guarantees. And you, you could think of that as changing the reward signal and actually wrapping the robot itself in some type of, uh, in this case, control barrier function or like a, a safe set of operation. So Zach, you began this work in your PhD. Where was that? Yeah, so I, I can give you my, my little background. Uh, so I, I got my bachelor's and master's at Tufts uh, in uh, like thermal fluid transport. So <laughs> an entirely different world. Uh, and then I got my PhD at Boston University uh, in kind of formal methods for control. Uh, my advisors were, were Colleen Belta and uh, Roberto Tron. Uh, and so I was looking at how do you do distributed formal methods? So large teams of systems working together under temporal logic constraints, uh, and then some like distributed sensing applications for that. So how do you do it with say distributed perception? Um, so uh, in grad school, were you working on reinforcement learning related problems then, or was that something you fell into a little later? Uh, towards the end of my PhD, that kind of got hot as a topic. And so that's that's when I started on it. Yeah. Um, I, I was working with uh, Xiao Li, who's now a, a postdoc uh, in, in Daniel Russo's lab at MIT. Uh, and so we put together uh, like our first pass of what like our formal methods plus reinforcement looks like, uh, reinforcement learning looks like. Uh, and so that's kind of where I got started. And, and now I've kind of moved into like... Uh, learning policies and then combining them on the on the fly without uh, retraining. So like zero shot task composition is, is what I'll talk about later too. Okay. And so today you work at Lincoln Labs, uh, you know, maybe for uh, people in the audience who aren't familiar with Lincoln, could you give a little bit of overview as to what Lincoln is all about and also kind of, you know, the areas that your group is focused on? Yeah, sure. So yeah, it feels like not a lot of people know what Lincoln Lab necessarily is, but it's a it's a part of MIT. Uh, I, I relate it to like uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab and NASA and Caltech, right? Those are the kind of the same relationship that Lincoln Lab has with MIT. Um, so we're a federally funded research and development center, which basically means that we work for like the Department of Defense or the government, uh, but we're still kind of like affiliated with, in this case, MIT. Um, so like MIT employees working uh, on on kind of like national security problems. If that makes sense. And and so uh, the group you're in, what is what is your focus? Yeah, so broad, broad, so broadly, uh, my group kind of focuses on air missile and maritime defense. That's kind of broadly the the mission that we focus on. Uh, I'm in an autonomy group within that, uh, and so we work a lot on uh, you know verifying safe control for for say UAVs or uh, in, in this particular some of the stuff I'll show you. We're looking at how do you deal with adversarial environments, right? A lot of reinforcement learning doesn't necessarily deal with like an environment that's actively trying to negate you from doing what you want to do, right? And so how do you get around kind of those type of changing strategies within the environment? Okay. Um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting that you say that. I mean, I, I talk a lot with folks at DARPA about these problems, guys like Alvaro Velasquez and, and Matt Marge, uh, who I know you have met as well. Yep. And, you know, it's kind of striking the, you know, the, the needs that uh, military organizations have for enforcing things like safety constraints or airspace deconfliction. Um, why else would we want to do this? Is there, you know, are there broader applications beyond defense? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of applications beyond defense. Uh, the FAA is the one; it's still government, but it comes to mind, right? So you could look at like ACASX, ACASXU, those kind of things, where you have, uh, sorry, airborne collision avoidance system. Uh, it's like a, a system that most of the commercial aircraft carry on board, right? Which is figuring out. So it's actually, interestingly enough, one of the first applications of Palm BPs that were really like deployed in the world. Uh, but essentially, it's deconfliction of like airspace, which is maybe similar to what you were talking about. Uh, and then beyond that, a lot of the systems that we work with outside of defense are like working alongside humans kind of things, right? You definitely don't want someone, a big robot to like step on you if you're thinking about like even boss dynamic spot, right? That's still a pretty heavy robot. Uh, so things like that, really, where you're like working close, close contact with humans. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. So... Um, well, why don't we get into uh, kind of the interesting stuff? Um, sure. Not that, not that your background isn't interesting, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, yeah, you said you wanted to start by going over some, you know, earlier work of yours that's kind of exemplar of, of this line of thinking. And, and why, don't, why don't you, uh, you yeah, know, I can, start with that? I can give a little bit of a background, maybe. So, so comparing like uh, what I'll call like your flavor of neural symbolic AI to, to ours. Uh, and so the way that I like to think about it is I don't ever really touch a, a neural network or an RL policy directly. I influence it through the things around it, right? So I, I play with like the way that rewards are encoded or the like actual environment, uh, environmental parameters that I allow the system to interact with. Uh, and so you could almost think of it as like learning the a, an augmented state of the environment or uh in the in the in the reward like case it's like uh pieces of reward that are based on some non non markovian past right uh and so ultimately that takes the form for the reward system as an automata usually with like each guard being the actual reward signal that you're training at any given time and then the control barrier function is is something from uh, the controls literature literature that essentially enforces uh, the system to stay within some safe set. And so we use that as like the uh, boundary within the environment. And something really cool there is if you have a safe set definition and a, a desired action from a neural network, uh, you can actually figure out the the like minimally modifying control between what you've been asked to do and what the like safe set allows you to do. And that difference can be returned as a like negative reward signal to the system. So it can basically say like, you wanted to do this control, here's the nearest control and here's how bad what you asked to do actually was. Uh, and so I can first talk talk through that kind of that paper. It's it's now a little bit older, it's from like 2019, uh, but in the, in the AI world, that's old, I feel like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, then, and then I'll move into something that's kind of more modern now of what we've been working on, which is uh, zero shot composition of, of Q tables, basically. So uh, there's been a whole line of work on learning simple policies, say like get to A and get to B within a re in, in an environment. Uh, there's actually a way if it's a Q table to like combine those directly. So if you wanna do A or B in some type of Boolean logic, I can actually guarantee that the like outcoming policy table from that will actually do A or B. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So so the 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 really like interesting nugget there is if you train uh n tasks, the way that you get the composition, you actually get two to the two to the n possible executions. Uh, and so that's kind of a way that we've been doing uh we've been playing capture the flag with this as kind of an exemplar game. Uh and so you can actually train like attack and defend policies and capture the flag and then combine them on the fly to get different behaviors based on what you want the system to do. Uh, so that's, those are kind of the two things that I'll talk about. I can start with the, the first here. I'm just gonna share the paper directly because that's probably easiest. Um, 
and I can give you the link to, to where this lives. Yeah, please um, do so we can include it in the description. Yeah. So uh, this paper is called A Formal Methods Approach to Interpretal Reinforcement Learning uh, for Robotic Planning. Uh, and it's it's Xiao, who's now at MIT, uh, myself, Guang, who's I believe a postdoc at Imperial College, and Colleen Delta, who's our advisor. Uh, and so there's a, a really nice uh, graphic here that I think I'll pull up first, because that's probably the most straightforward way of understanding it. So uh, we start with uh, what we'll call like user-defined knowledge, which is kind of task agnostic. So that's something like you can never bend your arm backwards and below a table or something, right? So very, very simple, like keep out regions, uh, things in your like control space that just aren't feasible. And then we also give the system some type of task specification, which I'll go through in this case is like the steps of making a hot dog. So like put it on the grill, take it off the grill, put it in the bun. Uh, there's like a series of, of logical uh, like implications that you can essentially build to des describe the recipe of a hot dog. Uh, this gets converted. Well, first of all, we ask, is this like satisfiable given the like knowledge that I know that I can and can't do in the world and the actual task you've asked me to do, the combination of those, if I, you know, like Cartesian product them, do I actually get a, something that's feasible? Uh, if yes, then we get something called a finite state predicate automata. And I'll, and I'll go through what that means. But basically, it's a graph that defines the steps that the system needs to go through. Uh, and in this case, the like edges between the different nodes are actually what we use as a reward signal. And so they're like, real valued state functions, like, I don't know, get your end effector to this point in the environment. Um, we then use that as, as a reward signal for, for some reinforcement learning agent, right? I actually don't care if it's PPO or, or DQN or DDQN, right? It doesn't actually matter. It's, it's functionally how, how the reward signal is built. Um, and then that automata actually enforces uh, a set of constraints in the environment, like safe sets that you don't want to violate, uh, don't collide with things, don't, you know, overextreme your arm, those kind of stuff. Um, you can take the RL action as well, feed that into the control barrier function, and you get out a safe action that's guaranteed to be safe. It might not be what the actual RL policy gave you, right? So I said before that, like, you get the nearest safer uh, control. And then you can, like, go out and execute this. You can train with this system, right? Because I can guarantee that there's, like, always safe actions being executed. Uh, you get the feedback into the RL policy through a reward that's basically like if you ask for a control action that's not feasible or not possible, it'll give you the like difference between those two. Uh, and then you'll also get feedback from like where you are in the actual automata, how how many tasks you've completed, that kind of thing. And so that's kind of your history. Why does uh, this feedback also go to the control barrier function? Ah, uh, so so the the feedback goes to the control barrier function as like a uh, really, it's like the current state of the environment. It's an update oh. kind of step. Yeah. Um, so that's actually this direction is more of a of a like here's the the state that you ended up in after that action, um, and that's how you keep track of like where you are in the tasks and where the control barrier function is in its environment. Uh, and then this feedback is more of a reward signal. I see. Yeah. And so this is kind of like the framework that I'll go through. Um, do you have any questions so far? Um. And and so I think you may have said it, but just to clarify, so you you also train the RL agent with the control barrier function in place. Yes. So so that's a big thing. So the the system itself is trained with the control barrier function, and so we, we train a lot in simulation a priori, right? Because you need need a lot of training data. But we also have done like in the loop kind of training with the actual hardware which is really cool uh, because the control barrier function essentially keeps you safe no matter what you try to do. Oh, I see. So so basically, if you have something that was um, maybe even trained without the control barrier function, you can throw it in a live system with the control barrier function and just kind of learn as you go. Uh, and yep. you're doing so while keeping safe. That's pretty yeah. cool. There's some limitations in that you need to have some understanding of the dynamics of your system, right? So if you like don't have a good model of your system, there are other ways to get a control barrier function representation, but you need to like train those first, right? Uh, but if you have like 
if it's a nine dimensional nine degree of freedom arm right and so it's high dimensional but like i can write down the odes that like describe its motion then you can find a control barrier function for it and then the training is really on like individual task level if that makes sense okay i think i understand the high level um okay. yeah i'm interested to dig down further yeah uh one thing i'll add which is really interesting is the way that this is broken down into that finite state automata to describe what you individual like pieces of a task are you can think of it that way you can actually train over each of the like states and edges individually to try to like focus down on harder tasks and i'll, and I'll get into that but there's a way of actually like point specifically training things that are hard and like limitedly training things that are easier and you can actually like do that on the fly anyway i'll get there um Okay, so let's go through this setup really quick so you can kind of see what we'll actually implement this stuff on. So there's a, a Baxter robot, so a, a two-armed robot. Uh, we're only using one of its arms. And then uh, a Jayco, which is also a like four-dimensional or five-dimensional arm. Uh, and it's they're both operating on this table. There's a grill <laughs> for uh, grilling hot dogs and then uh, a number of like stations. And so the... Uh, the pink one on the left is for where the hot dog starts. It goes on the grill. It just could go on the like blue plate. Baxter should pick it up and then put it on the green plate. And that's kind of like the order of operations. Uh, mirrored kind of in uh, Capelliusim or uh, VRAP is what I believe it's now called. Uh, we have like the same setup. Uh, and here you can actually see where the control barrier functions live. And I can zoom in on this. Um, So here the pink box is where the end effector is like kept within. So that's a control barrier function bound on like, you can never leave this box. Uh, and then we actually have like a, a bubble constraint around half of the grill so that the other arm can't like run into that bottom plane on the grill. Cause we still want it to be able to have access to the top but the actual front of the grill is, is off limits to this particular arm. Uh, and so the, this is kind of like what these in real time these systems are seeing. So this is uh, RVIS, basically representations of everything that they're dealing with. Uh, and so basically the the arm here can have a couple things that it can interact with, but it can't really go to the front of the grill. And then this one has to essentially main, remain within the, the what we call serve region. And it also has the safe region around the grill. Uh, so truncated linear temporal logic. Um, so if people are familiar with linear temporal logic, uh, and I'll assume necessarily that they aren't, but so uh, you have your Boolean logic, right? Which is like, and or not. And then you have your like first order logic, which is like those, but with kind of infinite time constraints on them. Uh, temporal logic is obviously the like next step up, which is reasoning about like, series or sequences through time. And so what we have is uh, it's fundamentally linear temporal logic, which means like time rolls out in a single linear sequence. Uh, and you can reason about things that happen along it with uh, conjunction. So like two things happen simultaneously, uh, disjunction, so or, so like one thing happens or another thing happens, uh, negation, so like not things happening. Uh, and then it's some bunch of really cool temporal operators. So eventually is within the sequence at some time point, a thing is true uh, until, so like one thing is true until something happens and then or one thing happens and then it's uh, another thing is true. And then next within the sequence, like the next time step that thing becomes true. Uh, and so essentially we can reason about order with that. Um, and and for the viewers, uh, we'll put a, we, ha we do have some videos on temporal logic we'll link in the description. Great. So. Yeah, so so linear temporal logic is kind of uh, the hammer that a lot of us use in this field. Uh, and so truncated linear temporal logic is kind of uh, an extension of that that uses what's called real valued predicates. So essentially now the, the logics that you're reasoning about in this are real valued functions. Uh, and so in this case, they're scalar functions given your state. Uh, and so you could say like, I don't know, 
f of some some the function of some state is like greater than zero. And you can give a real value to it, and that's essentially how we encode rewards. Um, and so I'll I'll get into this a little more in depth, but uh, your functionals here look something like gripper open of state, and given your state that that like gripper open function will give you, you know negative one to one of how open your actual gripper is on a given robot. And so you can now say that like, I don't know, at some point I want my gripper to be open. I can give it a like point in the sequence that I want it and like the value that I want it at. And the real value function will tell me whether my gripper is open or not. Um, um, and so, just a, a quick question, like, yeah. um, you know, what's the difference between this LTL variant and STL? Yeah, so so they're really similar. The big thing here is that STL doesn't really evaluate to an automata, right? It has like a robustness value, but it doesn't necessarily like give you an automata representation super easily. And this is like closer to LTL in that it comes up with a buki automata or something when you actually encode it. Uh, but now the guards are just real valued as opposed to uh, like Boolean. Okay, I see. Yeah. So it's it's like a real valued MTL is maybe another way to describe it, like metric temporal logic, but that's also not quite right. Um, really, it's just LTL with real valued predicates. Yeah, I guess. Um, and and for those of you who don't know, like uh, model checking with LTL, and I think also with CTL, if I'm I'm right, is basically done by converting the uh, specification, which is a temporal logic formula into some kind of automata. And then that makes it easy to compare it with your automata representing your system. Is that is that about right? Yep. Yeah. Right. So so classically, this would be done by like taking an LTL formula of like uh, eventually not A or something, right? And encode that as a graph. And you would take your like environment of say how my robot can move the, like you have a graph representation of that take the cartesian product of that and then you'd see if there were any like valid paths in that like it's called a product automata and if that's like if you can get to a and you ask to not a then like it would be false and if you could ask to get to a and there's a path that gets to a then that'd be true um that's kind of like classically how this would be done uh and so we encode this uh, into something called a finite state predicate automata, or FSPA, uh, which is kind of our version of, of that graph representation. Um, and so what that looks like is, uh, so if you wanted to take how to make a hot dog and turn that into a finite state predicate automata, this is what that would look like. Uh, so you could think of like, if the grill is not turned on, turn on the grill, right? And so that's state zero to one. Uh, like if you haven't put the hot dog on the grill, then like you sit there until you do in fact turn it on. And so you can kind of like follow this entire recipe to end state being I have made a hot dog. Uh, and so you can actually encode that in uh, TLTL pretty quickly. Uh, it's just you can literally like convert the lines in a recipe to that. Um, and so there are some really interesting functionals in here. Uh, I think the most interesting one to me is is ketchup applied, uh, which I, I I could go into the the uh, supplementary material of this, but it's actually like five different steps that we've kind of like aggregated into one function. But the really cool thing is here is the like robot arm has to learn to go in, pick up a like ketchup bottle turn it over, squeeze it over a hot dog, and then like put the ketchup bottle back, right? And so that's actually a very difficult task to learn with reinforcement learning, right? It's like both precise and complicated. Um, and so that gets back to my like comment earlier that is you can kind of focus down on different like sections of the subtasks uh, based on the, the automata and really like focus on training. So uh, some of these initial things like turning on the grill were like somewhat harder, but the, uh, you know, just here, uh, like grill is turned on, right? That's a fairly simple thing, to, fairly hard thing to do, but picked and placed is somewhat hard, uh, sorry, somewhat easy. And so 
this is like learning to flip a switch in a very specific place. So that's red is bad. Basically red is hard. Uh, but like picking and placing is easy, right? Because that's that's a blue task here. Uh, and so you can actually break down each step of the task that you're trying to learn into how difficult it is or is not to learn, depending on how much progress you make over time. Uh, and so that actually lets you like focus down on the hardest tasks to learn over time. Uh, so in this case, the like catch up pouring task is very hard. Uh, any questions so far? So these um, low level control issues, they're, they're not expressed in your language, correct? That's just, um, that's the language is kind of like one layer in hierarchy above that. Am I right? Yep. Yeah. So the, the like actual language is expressed in kind of like functions. And then we do have like definitions of what those functions are. You can think of them as like reward shaping, right? So like based on your state, it's really like a, a distance function to some goal point or uh, the like rollout of a trajectory being along like where you wanted it to go, those kind of things. So that, that's kind of the rewards under the hood, but the logic itself is enforcing the like which function gets applied at which time. I and the network. And the network itself, uh, you, you augment the state like of the all the robots with a like current state in the automata, and so you could think of that as like the network learning. Given like what the state input is, I'm trying to map to a given function. Okay, I see. So so basically, the logic is used for that higher level, and in one way to think of this work is, you know, the problem you know, you're attempting to solve is as reinforcement learning guides it to solve each of these tasks uh, represented by the different Q states, you want to do it in a way that respects the uh, uh, the safety constraints you had on the screen a little while ago. Yep, exactly. Okay. So yeah, that's that's like the, the long and the short of it. Um, and there's a really fun set of videos that I maybe I'll... Uh, endeavor people to go watch because watching videos on zoom is hard but uh but yeah so that's kind of the the start of where we did all of this um and so this was pretty good and if you wanted to take a temporal logic uh formula and convert it into essentially a reward shaping problem so essentially it builds out the the like fspa to be your your reward oracle if you want to think of it that way uh for a reinforcement learning task and so we've kind of moved from here to saying, well, each of those kind of guard states you could learn individually and then try to do some like on the fly, you know, zero shot composition of those tasks. And so we moved into, uh, let me just hide my... so we moved into looking at who kind of like in the past has looked at uh, composition of tasks and so we we came across this paper, which is uh, a Boolean task algebra for reinforcement learning uh, by Benjamin Rossman is, is uh, the person who I usually look up when I want to find these papers. Uh, and, and his kind of lab has looked a lot at how do you do the kind of like zero shot composition of tasks using reinforcement learning. Uh, and this paper, the most notable thing about it uh, is it came up with a way of if you have a Q table. Uh, to combine multiple Q tables in a way that like satisfies a Boolean algebra. And so the way to think about this here is if you have like go to the left or go down or go not left, right? Uh, you can actually now get the like Boolean combination or disjunction, conjunction, negation of those tasks. And so like you could think of the disjunction or the or of left and down as like any of the boxes on this side of like the environment. Uh, and there's actually a, a really nice formal like way of writing that down in, in a queue table logic. Uh, and so if you have say your value iteration learning a queue table, uh, this now lets you do essentially zero so shot composition of learned policies from that queue table. Um, any questions so far? No, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And so 
there's obviously the, the obvious uh, extension of this, right, is you can move this now to like neural network based queue learning. You like lose the formal guarantee of it not being a queue table anymore. But you can say that like if the neural network converges to some optimal policy that is like reflected by that queue table, then you still kind of get those guarantees, right? And so you're like losing the formal guarantee on it. But you're saying if you can converge to an optimal policy, then like it will be verifiable in that way. Does that make sense? Okay, well, um, so, but I mean, you have no, I mean, you have no guarantee no. to an optimal policy in real right. life. So Right, exactly. Uh, so that's yeah. the kind of like thing you give up <laughs> if you want this to work on, on like a, a real like complicated robotic system, right? And so that's why you ultimately need some other safety system like control barrier functions on, on the thing if you actually want it to be like, no kidding safe, but this gets you at least to like zero shot composition for tasks, which I think is useful. Yeah, and I could see that like, you know, I would guess if you would do something like this, even though there's no guarantee, it's probably going to be sort of closer, you know, to where you, to, to being safe than if you didn't do this. And probably yep. makes it easier if you have another layer with safety constraints to like make small modifications and, and meet it. Yep. So that's you must be prophetic. That's where we're going. So the the idea here, right, is we took this and we added what we call safety aware constraints on top of it. So that's not necessarily like guaranteed safety, like in the safe RL community. But it's it's so constrained MVPs are kind of like one way to do that, right? Uh, the other way is to essentially enforce a structure that the system learns like a ranked badness of things it could possibly do. And it chooses the one that's least bad if there is no like viable solution. Uh, and so that's kind of what we call safety aware is essentially in the like the degrading of quality of the solutions, you pick the ones that are least bad and, and I'll define what least bad is for us. Um, but that's kind of like the direction that we started going with this. Um, we like, as we dug into this paper, we realized that the way that they define negation wasn't ideal for robotic systems. Uh, so it, it worked really well for your like classic games if you want to play like Starcraft or something, right? But as soon as you try to go into like a continuous environment, uh, the way they did negation was they decided at each time point in the environment, like where to draw a symbol from. So like, say you're in an environment, you're driving around, you essentially like hover over the environment until you decide to like land somewhere. And that's when you make a symbol in this logic. And so that is really difficult for a robot to do because it lives in a continuous space, right? And so some of our work is really fi figuring out how do you like no kidding and code uh, a, lo a, a, a policy that can't leave the environment for some time, right? Does that track so far? So yeah, that's interesting. So with, I mean, maybe if you could say a little more about how negation is different. So you, so in the pair in the in the abstraction you described, it's kind of only. You it's know, almost trivial, you, right? What's that? It's almost trivial, right? Because like you can just decide not to land somewhere, and then you negation does, is satisfied, right? Okay. So then how did you change that? Yeah, so that's kind of the, the trick of all. I'll, I'll get there, maybe, but okay. we're, we're almost there. Um, so I like to show these this paper specifically because it has great graphics for understanding like how this all works, and that was very key for us. Uh, and so this is kind of the environments that they, they started out with. Um, and so they're all discrete, uh, and the goal here is essentially going to one of the four kind of regions in the corners, right? Uh, and so you could abstract like going left, right, as having being in any of those two environments on the, the left side. Similarly, top, um, it kind of comes out the same way, right, come in one of the two top regions. Uh, but then there kind of, here's a conjunction, disjunction, uh, and then uh, nor, I think, and uh, nan. Um, but yeah, so so basically you can do Boolean compositions of these things uh, pretty quickly uh, once you have learned kind of left and top. Uh, and like the power of all this is that 
if you train n tasks, you end up with two to the two to the n possible Boolean combinations of those tasks. And so you actually use like exponential explosion explosion to your advantage, right? <laughs> you learn a lot fewer tasks and you end up with a lot of combinations of those tasks that you can now in zero shot kind of deploy. Um, and so kind of an example of this is if you didn't have task composition, right? To learn, say like 10 tasks, right? The number of solvable tasks would still be 10, right? But if you only had disjunction of different policies, you get up to like uh, some larger number than that, but that's still linear. Uh, but if you have actual full task algebra, then you get this like two to the two to the n explosion. And within like even four learned tasks, there are a bunch of, uh, I think, a hundred different combinations or something like that. Um, so yeah, so this is this is kind of the power of it. Um, and they were using uh, this environment here. Uh, this is kind of the toy environment that they were working with, uh, where they essentially wanted to go to different colored and different shaped areas within the environment. And so you learn that as like, go to squares, go to circles, and then go to purple, go to blue. Uh, and so you can actually combine that now and say, go to the purple square. Uh, and it'll really quickly come up with a policy or zero shot, come up with a policy to go to say the purple square, uh, assuming that you've trained, you know, purple, blue, tan, and you don't move things in the environment, right? Because that's also important. Uh, does that make sense so far? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of where they ended. You could think of like the value functions for each of those mapped over the environment as, as like these really interesting plots. Um, and the way they train this is they actually train individual tasks and their negations. Um, but again, their negations are over like not going to a region, which is very kind of a strange way of describing it. Um, and so we extended all of their value function approximations uh, in a paper that we call safety aware task composition for discrete continuous reinforcement learning. Um, so the kind of additions to their work are we added the concept of like safety awareness or like basically if you're going to violate how how should you violate any of these uh, given compositions. Uh, we added a like continuous vibe to it. So they were only really working over discrete environments. We moved it to continuous environments. Um, and then, yeah, we the thing that's not in the title is, is we went and dug down into their negation and made it so that essentially negation now works at like a continuous uh, level, if that makes sense. Uh, and so, I'll go a little bit into safety aware violation because I think that's really helpful. Uh, and so here's a just a very simple toy environment. Uh, you have regions labeled A, regions labeled B, uh, regions labeled C, and then you have other regions that are labeled like AB, ABC. So they're like combinations of different labels. And the idea here is that as you move through the environment at every region, uh, in this case, it's a discrete environment, but every region that you move between, you essentially make a label. So you make like A if you move into this region, you make B if you move into this region. And so what we're really reasoning about here is, uh, you know, finite traces of an MVP in this environment. And so for safety awareness, ultimately, if we tell you like make C in this environment, we don't really want to make the other labels. The idea here is that like, if you say did the B action in this case, it could be bad, right? Just because of the way I've asked you to do the task. And so we tried to encode a way of finding the like minimally viable solution to these problems. And if that exists, then go for it. But if you have to violate something, make as few labels that aren't what I requested as possible is essentially the encoding. And so if you start on say this part, this side of the environment and you wanted to make C, so in this case, the blue blue label, uh, the blue arrows here, uh, you'd have to go through A, right? There's no way to get around this environment uh, and not be able to go and not be able to go through something that's not C. Uh, but the way we've encoded this is essentially that you get reward, a uh, higher reward and I'll, I'll go through the word structure a little bit, but uh, essentially, 
the reward is make as few symbols as possible that aren't the thing you want. Uh, and so that's kind of our safety awareness here is that we don't want you to like go through regions or go through the minimum number of regions that you can uh, that are labeled something other than what you want. And so that's what we described as a kind of a minimal, minimally violating path. Uh, and so the system, the way we have it is it'll, if you try to make something that it can go to without making other labels, it'll go to those regions without like ever entering another region. Uh, and then if you have to make another a label that wasn't something you requested, it'll make the minimum number of those. And that's kind of the like safety awareness encoding that we've, we've set up. Uh, does that make sense so far? Yeah, I see that. Cool. And so um, there are kind of four kind of paths that you could think of. There's the pure path, which is like, it goes directly to the goal region and doesn't enter any other region. And so that satisfies like the task that we've asked you to satisfy. Um, a minimally violating path is one where there are like no other paths that are shorter and no other paths that make fewer like wrong labels is the way you can think of it. Um, a safe path is one that like there's no path really that you can execute that will go through a region that you didn't ask it to go through. Um, and then a prioritized safe path is one where you uh, essentially execute such that there's a uh, shortest, shortest path to a region that doesn't actually go through any of the other regions. You know. um, and so those are kind of the, the structure of quality of paths, if you want to think of it that way. Um, and functionally, what we do is we train uh, for every region or label that we want to make two different policies. Uh, one of them that goes to the region of interest uh, and one of them that doesn't go to the region of interest. Uh, and so that's that's kind of the way that you can encode negation in, in a sense. Um, and so the idea for that is that you get an extended queue function that uh, builds a trace that is kind of uh, goes to other goals <laughs> in a sense, right? Because if you don't want to go to A and you have B and C, it actually goes to B and C. Uh, and so that lets you encode a kind of negated form of a task. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like because there's Okay. Um, it's it's visually very straightforward, but like not necessarily that straightforward when you think about it. Um, okay. So I'll start with just tasks uh, and, and then that same environment. So if I want to go to A, I want to make the label A, right? Uh, starting from any point, each of these arrows tells you essentially which direction to drive in in order to like go and accomplish your task. So if you start on any of the these three, say, regions, right, the obvious action is to just go to the right, and you'll end up in a region that makes A, and you've, you've done it. Um, if you, say, start in, what is it, 4-1, uh, right, the, like, shortest path to get to A is essentially to, like, drive out and around, down, and then you'll, you'll get to A. Uh, and that avoids C, very importantly. If you're already in C, there's nothing you can do. You've made it a letter C, so like drive to A, and that's the best you can do, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Similarly, you can do those for, for B and C. Um, a and B, same idea, right? You don't want to drive to C, and everything else is, is good. Oh, I um, think I already know where negation is going by seeing these. Yep. Uh, yeah. And and so, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll, the negation ones at the bottom here, right, are like not A and not B. Uh, it, it's it's essentially bad to drive into A and B. And so what you really want to do is like drive into C. And so C becomes the really like goal for not A or not B. Um, and so really you need to understand what the other goals are in the region in order to really build negation. It's kind of the way that we've looked at this. Um, and so that's kind of the functional encoding here uh, is you really train like a policy to go to specifically that region, and then a policy to go to any other region that's not that thing. Uh, nice. And it's, it turns out that that's really the like secret sauce here, that if you can do both of those, that little extra training to get the like negated policy, 
uh, in, in this like formulation, it all works pretty well. Um, and so we've kind of extended that. So we started back into the, the their environment of like going to different shapes and tasks. Um, and, and we just basically said that like, yes, this works the same way, except now we can like move through the environment and make a label at every given state that we move through. Um, and then the kind of cool part of this is up at the top, sorry. Uh, as I said before, you can like apply the same ideas to a like, no kidding, like MLP kind of uh, encoding. Uh, and you can use that to drive continuous uh, actions in an environment. And so this is kind of like just a double integrator ball where we've taught it to go to purple regions, blue regions and white regions. Uh, and then we can on the fly zero shot do like uh, sphere and not purple becomes like the white ball, right? Uh, similarly, sphere and not purple, or sorry, sphere or not purple is anything that's blue. Uh, and then blue and sphere is kind of like this uh, trajectory that goes around the purple ball. Uh, and so it can essentially learn that combination without ever being trained to do that specific task. Oh, that's that's pretty neat. Yeah. Um, and so, so uh, I mean, just kind of out of curiosity, would this not work if you had an open world uh, logic? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> you're thinking you're thinking like a, a LLM kind of environment type deal, or um, I'm thinking, well, even just like an old school tri-valued logic where you have true, oh. false, and unknown. Sure. Yeah. So unknown could be a way of of like encoding, maybe not, but it doesn't work as well. I don't think mostly because the you wouldn't get the safety awareness. I think is the problem there. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose it. I suppose it would go back to how you would define negation, like if it's strong or weak negation or something like this. Yeah, negation always ends up being the tricky wicket of all this stuff, right? It's like, yeah. however you define negation is really what makes or breaks you. Um, and so, so yeah, uh, this is this is kind of what we have. We're working right now on extending it to, to temporal logics. Um, so uh, LTL specifically is what we're moving towards. Uh, yeah, I guess why I was curious about the open world question is, uh, you know, if you're, so if, if you're combining uh, these things in, in uh, like a real world robotic environment, I, I'm kind of curious as to, um, you know, how you think about training for these negated cases. Yeah, so the the main thing that we've kind of found in this is that you have to like constrain the size of your MDP to something specific. Right, oh. So you essentially need to fix the environment size. Um, that's how a lot of this stuff really works because you can actually gauge the, there, there's a relationship between the reward signal and the size of the environment. So what we've kind of, how we've encoded some of that. Uh, and so that's like, for this particular paper, we require that the, like the, the size of the MVP is, is defined a priori. Um, I think we want to move in, a case where that's not necessarily the case, but that's like where we are now is, is it needs to be defined. Okay. I mean, there's still, there seems to be a ton of applications for that. So yeah, yeah. It's yeah. not the end of the world, but it's like th there are less than satisfying answers to some of this stuff, but you know, that's research, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it keeps us employed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. So, so yeah, that's that's mostly what I had to show, um, and I can I'll send you the links so that people can uh, go look at the videos if they want. In the no, system. I think that's good. Um, yeah, uh, just as we as we close, Zach, um, you know, maybe if you could kind of talk about, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, I always get a lot of students who are really interested in RL and in robotics. You know, what would your recommendations be for? someone who has like just finished their bachelor's or is in their master's degree and considering research or even a doctorate, like what would you say would be some really hot things to, to look at? Yeah, I guess. So at that stage in your career, I actually think that like going back to seeing what people did in like non-learning based RL is really important because I think fun fundamentally understanding like 
how MDPs work, right? Really gets you pretty far in a lot of this stuff. And like being able to understand the nuances of the, the simpler things kind of gets you there. I don't know. I'm a controls theorist at, at heart, right? And so like that field has been around for, for two or 300 years. Um, and, and so I think starting with the fundamentals really gets you something that you can build on really effectively. Um, I don't know. I usually try to go from the opinion that like, the learning stuff right now is is not as well defined as like the hardcore controls problems. And so if you can start with the hardcore controls problems and bring in some learning, that I think is valuable. Uh, I think a lot of people kind of just like, oh, throw a neural network at that random unicycle thing. And it's like, no, I could, I know what the form of that solution should be. Maybe I should use, you know, parameterized learning on 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 that unicycle, right? And like, only learning what you need to is really important to me. I don't know. It's just my opinion. I, I actually think that's an interesting philosophy. I mean, um, you know, I think I think you can think of a lot of things in that regard, because if you keep if you're able to keep more stuff kind of in the symbolic space, um, you've sort of constrained where, you know, the perceptual errors can come in. To the Exactly. Space. So yeah. Yeah, so like I we've we've had a lot of experience deploying like both machine learning and not machine learning systems on on some pretty complicated dynamical systems. And I found that like relearning a, a controller <laughs> is not a useful thing, but like learning which controller to use at which time can be really helpful, right? Like so so not necessarily like reinventing the wheel on things that we understand, but like making decisions at a higher level is is something that learning obviously does quite well. Um, but necessarily like learning your, your you know, PID controller is not necessarily something you necessarily need. Um, I don't know, that's just my my philosophy of things. <laughs> no, I think that's, that's an interesting approach. So, well, hey, uh, Zach, uh, just wanna thank you again for taking the time to talk to us and, uh, you know, the audience of the Neurosymbolic channel and you know, we look forward to hearing more from you and your research as it progresses. Yeah, thank you for having me on. It's been really great.